Welcome to Yacht Fum, where we talk about the women that make the yachting industry. I am your host, Andrea Tagliaferro. Learn who they are, how they got into yachting, and what they do today. Today we talk to Leah Tintaud. She is a yacht charter specialist based in Monaco. Leah has worked as crew on boats. She achieved a master's while being a yachty, lived a life as an entrepreneur, worked with one of the biggest yacht brokerage companies in the world, and more. Hi Leah, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? Well, thank you so much for being here today and being pretty much holding my hand on my first podcast because I'm a little bit shaky. Can you share with us a little bit about your background? Where did you grow up and how did you get into the yachting industry? So um, basically, I was born in Paris in France. My mom's English from uh, she was born in uh, near London and my father is French from Paris. So um, I ended up moving from Paris to the south of France when I was a little kid. So most of my childhood I spent in the south of France, which is very, very close to yachting and the sea and everything. So I was very connected uh, with that side of um, the business very, very young. And I actually used to um, be a chief stewardess on board super yachts when I was going to university to pay for my studies. So this is how I started. How did you go from university kid to full-time yacht crew? Well, it was um, it was an opportunity, really, something I didn't look for, really. Um, I used to work at, at a bar near the port um, for like a weekend job. And all the captains and all the charter brokers were coming to this um, cafe near the near the port um, after yacht shows and everything like that. So I got to um, speak with them and and I was curious about this industry and I was wondering, you know, how was life at sea and everything. And, you know, I read a lot of books when I was a child. So I was like, oh, my God, is it like Hemingway? And, you know, <laughs> do you see like big uh, fish like this and stuff like that? So a little bit of an adventure uh, spirit, really. And one day, one of the captain was uh, looking for someone to fill a position in Viareggio, which is something like seven hours driving from where I was in Nice. Mm -hmm. And he said, listen, really, basically, the job is exactly what you do. is serve people cafe and cocktails and, you know, uh, and be there for them. It's catering. Plus, you have to clean a little bit behind them and make the bed and blah, blah, blah. So it was, it was very for me. Oh my, can I do this really? Blah blah blah. He said, "Oh, there is someone on site who could train you. She will be your chief stewardess. So it's, it, I'm sure you'll be fine for it." So he, he he gave me a lot of confidence to get in the okay. job. So I quit my job and then went to Viareggio like three days after that. It was in the spur of the moment, and then uh, I started like this. I went to Viareggio and I met the owner. We had this interview and he said, well, okay, you with us for the next six months. So this is how I started. Wow, that would be a little bit nerve wracking for me. I actually did the stewardess as well. Very few people know that about me. And I did not have that roll off my tongue as easily as you did. My first day there, I had never been a waitress, never been anything. I just sort of landed into that situation because the stewardess they had left on holiday so it was just like you gotta do this and and i didn't know what was expected or how things had to look people don't know how hard it actually is from what i read you went from being in the charter and from heavily on the yacht side and being on board as crew then you transition into land and this is something that we get asked a lot a lot of people that i've met that are a crew did not know that that was a possibility, and I think you have done that beautifully. How did you transition from yacht crew to land-based? About 10 years ago, when I started uh, to do that, uh, no, maybe eight years ago, when I started to do that transition, um, not a lot of people could do that, I think. And, and I had the chance to have... Um, um, a master's degree so I did my education at the same time as I was a stewardess on board during the summer 
So I think that helped me land a job in the um, logistic side and and people, uh, well, my first employer realized that I had um, the experience of being a crew on board and what was going on on the charter aspect of things on board. And they could use that skill um, plus the knowledge I had with languages and speaking, I speak four different languages. So because I had that skills uh, combined, I think that made the difference. So I don't know if any of the, because it's such a closed industry and world in Europe. Uh, I mean, I'm not too sure about how it works in, in the US and if it's more chilled or different. No, but in Europe, it's, it's very, and you have to have that kind of uh, degree or you have to prove that you know either a lot of people that could charter yachts or that you are capable of, um, you know, being diplomatic in any situation and that you know a little bit about law and contracts and regulations and stuff like this. So I think I had this uh, window of opportunity because I combined the two experiences at the same time, the, the master's in international, international relations and the experience on board. Um, I think that's a possibility for, um, for a lot of chief stewardess who has more than four or five years experience. I'm sure this will be a, a valuable uh, asset for any company if they ask to make the transition and learn about how to organize a contract and all the logistics because that's not something you can't learn. It's, it's really, you have to be proper trained. But Okay, well, two questions about that. First, what are the four, fourth language, four languages you speak? I assume two, of course, English and French. What are the other yes. two? Italian. In Monaco, you have to. And my oh. uh, degree was in international relations between France and Italy. Uh, so I speak Italian fluently and a little bit of Spanish because I used to uh, live in Madrid for a year for my Erasmus uh, program. Yeah. So I speak a little bit of Spanish. It's mixed up with Italian a little bit sometimes, but I can understand and make myself understood. I know uh, I speak Spanish, English, and a little French. And after the, the shows, because I'm surrounded by all the fabulous yacht designers that many of them are Italian, I leave the week imagining that I'm actually fluent in it, which is completely not true. Um, the other thing was when you're in a full-time job, I, sometimes it's a bit overwhelming to think that you can actually master being there present for your, for your staff and for the, the owners of the yacht, as well as actually achieve the masters that you were able to. How did you manage to get a masters while working full-time on a yacht? Well, the mission I had on board yachts during the five years was, was summer. And it was convenient for the owner to employ me during the summer and then let me go for the winter from uh, October to May uh, so, so that he wouldn't have a salary to pay. And then I would come back during the summer when it was um, the summer holiday for a university. So I could manage to organize my uh, schedule around that because I I started obviously a little bit later than all the other students because September was the actual um, going back to school bit and I was still on board. So I, st I started one month uh, later and then I had to arrange to pass my exams uh, like in af just after May and I kind of had some special all the time, you know, I arranged around my job on the yacht and my exams and I always managed to do that so I could combine the two things summer and winter kind of activity. That sounds great because I do know a lot of them take that time off to do a lot of traveling but if this was a goal for them this could definitely be something they could organize into their schedule. At least now there's a lot of information out there available for people that are crew what do you do after you get off the yacht so People are starting to think of it sooner rather than later, which is what happened at least to people that are around my age, uh, late 30s, they're coming off boats and now they're starting to realize what is the path I'm going to do. So I think that's amazing. 
Um, I do know, uh, if we're talking about land base, you had a great interview at Burgess. Uh, Sally, in the States, if you do not have a, a residency or a citizenship, it's very hard to employ you. Um, so you went back to Monaco, but that worked out beautifully. You were four years at Edmiston. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, it was one of the biggest um, position I had uh, when I started the my career, really. I had this one year experience in a family based office in, in the south of France called Ocean Drive. And then I went to um, I jumped to a corp big corporation, which was very different because on the family based business, you actually do kind of you do a little bit of everything and you you find solution for everything that comes at you. And there is no different department for CA uh, management looking after yachts and optimizing their schedule and finding new clients for uh, to be on yachts or retail uh, charter. So that was blend. It was like a one department I I had to um, make work. And I did, a, I did a little bit of reporting, accounting, marketing, and the family base, you touch everything. And then it's like if, if you know how it's organized in the kitchen, for example, it's, it's the same thing. If you have a small restaurant and you're the chef, you do a little bit of everything. If you're in a big, big restaurant with a lot of staff, you have one person for the pastry, one person for the chef de partie, one person for the dessert. And then in big corporations, it's, it's exactly that, like that. Some of the jobs that I used to do were separated into different roles and I had to stick to one side, one particular focus of the charter business, which was very interesting because you do it a lot deeper and you focus on that particular aspect, which was uh, charter management, which was looking after yachts at Edmiston, and was very interesting because also you have to collaborate with other people and um, and have a lot of colleagues, which was new for me, uh, and work in a team and do some cross selling opportunities because some information when you have a lot of roles in one industry, some information gets lost. So you sometimes you have to go back to thinking global and say, okay, I know this and this and that, maybe that could serve the sales department. And then you start to work your way in like this. And this is what I did uh, at Edmus. And I really, really enjoyed my time here. And I had the opportunity to meet gorgeous people, very interesting people from different background and nationalities. It was very, very rich. And you made amazing connections there, too, because being under Absolutely. that umbrella and the networking is you already have a foot in the door, which, yeah. as you know, coming from a, a small company, is not the case. You constantly have to introduce yourself. And this is what I do when you just have that. And if, especially if you go to introduce yourself at the Monaco Yacht Show, where a big portion of it is, you know, bread <laughs> with the company yeah. covers, it's pretty easy saying that's my company. So yeah. I do understand that. Um, I wanted to go a little bit. You said that uh, while you were there, you were super happy. You were offered this position to disrupt the industry. Um, you had that entrepreneurial moment, but then you actually shifted out of it. Uh, what yeah. was it exactly? Well, I, um, I was offered, offered a position to build a platform online, um, same as Airbnb or bookings or something like this that would disrupt disrupt the the way of chartering yachts or buying yachts. So I was very interested in in modernizing the industry because I think the yachting industry is very, very um, working on ancient ways and it's not moving very, very fast, but it's yes. protecting itself also. So um, they, the yachting industry, especially in the charter um, uh, matter, they have organized an association called MIBA, so yeah. the Mediterranean uh, Yacht Broker Association, and they federated um, the industry into common standards. So I think because they protect themselves uh, to for to achieve the same standards, it's very hard to um, 
to how do you say that in English? I don't know. <laughs> to um, say it in French. Catch up, up, on <laughs> <laughs> catch up on new technology and everything yeah. like this, because everyone has to be uh, has to agree on how it works and everything like that. So, um, so when I was offered that position, I was like, oh, great! I could build that platform and then eventually sell it to all the actors yeah. in, the, in the industry as a B2B tool. But my um, the, the biggest um, shareholder in that venture mm -hmm. didn't share my strategy. And then he wanted more to become a part of the industry as an, uh, a direct actor of the industry in competition with all uh, the brokers and everything, which I disagreed. And at the, well, at the beginning, I started to uh, try and dissuade him not to do that by saying, and you know, it, and it was such an amazing opportunity. I think I've never been, um, you know, offered something like this, even in terms of, you know, uh, position and, and career wise, it was really interesting for me. So I, I, I tried to hang on to it, but then it was too different. It was too different from what I really believed in, in terms of how the yachting would evolve and, he had ways I didn't really agree on, with, so I decided we decided to part ways. We said, "Well, we don't agree. Let's not make ourselves miserable. You carry on. I do something else." So that is I very recuperated my shares and then I moved on to something else. Can you tell the audience what are you doing now? Uh, currently, I'm working for a company called John Taylor Yachting. It's originally John Taylor is originally a real estate company. And they decided to open their yachting branch. So they bought the company I'm working, I, I was, I used to work for. So I used to work for a company called Sea Mines. And uh, they bought that company and we became John Taylor Yachting. So um, now we work under that commercial name, John Taylor Yachting, and we develop the sales my CEO de developed the sales um, aspect of um, the business and I developed the charter aspect of the business. And because of all this, um, the way it works, the way the industry works, we partner with the uh, Amoeba company to, mm -hmm. um, to actually organize all the charters and everything like this. And we are in the middle of... Um, of deciding if we should keep the Meba company name or if we could we change to John Taylor Yachting altogether. At the moment, it's a little bit confidential because uh, it's not really official. Uh, well, thank you for the scoop. <laughs> <laughs> the company we are actually uh, putting our shares in. So I don't want. I'm not allowed to tell you the name of that Meba company, but it will be revealed very very soon, like in the next two weeks. Do you miss, now that you are officially what we call the land-based people, the ones that are not working yeah. on yachts, um, do you miss being crew? Was Every that like, day. Really? <laughs> <laughs> How come? Well, I, think because, <laughs> I think because the brain is made like this. You only remember the best memories. And all the things you used to say, oh, I hate this, I hate this, I would never do that again you kind of forget about them and you only keep the nicest things and the amazing experience it's, it's been for the, for the five years I've been doing that. So it was incredibly, um, you know, all the, even the landscapes, the people you meet, the, the guests you serve, there are so many different kind of people. Some are really, really terrible. Some are very inspiring. Uh, the, also the crew sometimes you you okay. uh, click with someone and then some sometimes you it doesn't work and you have to find a solution so it's very rich for those who don't understand what she means remember when you're crew you're sharing the bunk you are in very tight quarters so if you don't like yeah. someone this is a big 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 issue and then you're praying for them to move on <laughs> in some way or another yeah. Uh, personally, I do remember a lot of my bad ones when I was a stewardess. Oh God, because I, I was on a private that felt like a charter, um, yeah. but then I was the only stew and a 130 footer. 
and yeah. the person always wanted to have parties and our parties were like 30 plus people plus the stewardess and they didn't want to hire extra help for the events. Right. So you, not only were you all the way around, our team was not mm -hmm. how you described the, the small uh, companies. Our team was, even though it was only like six or five people, which I don't remember at the moment, everybody stayed in their lane. So the moment um, the captain had done driving the boat, he was done. He was literally done drinking and off the boat, smoking cigars when pretty much everything inside was going down in flames. So uh, camaraderie is very important and teamwork uh, when you're Definitely. doing it. I was. I realized by speaking with other crew and other people that shared my experience that I was super lucky. First yes. of all, I always had amazing captain so that and I think the captain really set the it's ambiance so. on board exactly so if you know I was struggling in something and then the chief mate for example said oh this is not my work blah 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 um, I've done my job and you know this is nothing to do with me the captain I had like three three different captains during my five years and then every one of them were like listen guys we are on the same boat when you are you know uh, struggling she'll help you and that's the way it works and i always had the chance to have that kind of spirit on board which made the whole thing so much easier because we we stick together no that's so true i, I had three captains and one of them was as you are describing if something fell He was the first one on the floor cleaning it up. He didn't really care what status or what station you were on. And then, like I said, the other one was so drunk that the, the owner was on board. It was only like 9 p.m. He wanted to move the yacht and the, the captain was incapacitated and we could not leave because... Wow. He had decided at 9 p.m. owner on board, he was off duty because he had docked the boat. And, <laughs> and the was, owner was okay with that? The other person also drank heavily, and right. I think he found this amusing. But in my, I'm very different. I would have said fired. In my head, it was just screaming the word, like, get off my boat. Yeah. Are you insane? Yeah. Like the chef <laughs> saying, like, I already gave you breakfast. I'm done. <laughs> that does not happen. So it's really nice to hear that uh, you had such a positive experience in working in the yachting industry yeah. for so long um, with different captains and in different scenarios. I also think the fact that you were you had a beautiful uh, life balance being on the boat, but you also had your time back being, yeah. and pursuing something you were truly. So in a sense, you were able to step out, even re-examine and see like, if you really wanted to stay in the role you were and you had options. Other people, yeah. after it's like two years, they really have pair, uh, stopped their life for two years and they have to just keep going. You were constantly nurturing both of your paths. So at the end of the day, you were creating options for you, for yourself daily. Uh, what do you see the yachting industry moving towards in five years? We know it moves at a slower pace than things do yeah. on land. Um, uh, but when you're really in the nitty gritty and which you are in Monaco, which is almost yachting everywhere you churn. Where do you see the yachting industry going? Well, um, I, I've seen a lot of evolution since I first started, uh, especially um, in terms of regulations. A lot of things have changed in, in, in charters, for example, in terms of VAT implementation, where you start your charter. Um, a lot of company bloom like um, fiscal representative lawyers and everything so a lot of the side business of yachting are expanding and because of the re regulation i think uh, there is more and more opportunity to regulate how uh, people have the right to exercise as a charter broker or as a sales broker uh, because as uh, you are a stewardess today Um, you you don't have any certification for it. You can be uh, put on board a yacht. You you just have to pass the STCW 95 and then you are uh, officially a stewardess. But yeah. you don't you don't really have um, all the knowledge 
to be able to perform very well. So as your experience, you were, um, you said you were thrown into the business and you didn't know what was expected. Um, so I think a lot of possibility for side, um, side business schools or certification or regulations to actually implement those standards so that um, people know what kind of um, you know quality this boat is or this broker or company is uh, because at the moment it's very very not transparent it's very opaque the business is we don't really know which company it turns to and I'm in the yachting industry so I know Burgess and Edmiston but sometimes my clients don't even know those big guys so um, for the, the the end client, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes you say Burgess. It's not like if you say Airbus in the aviation business, for example, or yeah. you know Boeing. So they do, they don't have that kind of stamp to say, "Boom, we are the authority on yachting," kind of thing. So I think that is going that way, especially by. Burgess taking charge a little bit more because they are, they have, a, you know, they are the authority at the moment. And um, they try to change that, I think. Also, Camper and Nicholson were, were, they were talking in the, in the past, uh, in the past about regulating that. And I, I know in, in the US, for example, to become a real estate broker, you have to pass a certain certification, similar yes. as to be a sales broker or chart broker. Here in Europe, no. You employed in the company, and then you can become overnight a charter broker who doesn't know anything about, you know, contracts and stuff. So I think it's going this way. We're trying to implement also standard not in the quality of the boat we recommend to our clients, but also in the way we actually do business with them, and and certification as in the aviation business, the private jet business, they have some exterior certification not MIBA which is an in, inside B2B kind of mm -hmm. association that certifies standards. So um, I wanted to ask you um, if you have some advice going back. What do you wish you had known your first day in yachting? I would say Leah take your time it's different you know if you go land-based you'll have to be a little bit more patient if you want to achieve things you have to go step step by step and you know and then don't take anything personally it's not because it's you it's just because because the way things are land based it's not the same kind of opportunities you get when you're on board and taking charges when you land base you have a boss who has a boss who has a boss so people report to different bosses in on board, you just have to go to the captain and say, okay, I want this that way. Yes, no, boom, it's done. So it's it's very different. Yes, so adapt. I, Adaptation is key when you go from uh, an onboard job to a land job. I, I look forward to seeing all the updates. I can't wait to see, uh, get that new, the scoop from you guys, what is the name? Um, and we're so happy. You're such a great story to tell and to inspire other people that see that you can actually do it if you have a goal set in the beginning and not just fumble onto it in the end. So many ways to enter the yachting industry. And especially uh, if you are different than me, who, was, who started as an academic and then started my way into summer you can do the other way. You can actually start um, in the yachting industry and then start to think about your next move. What's going to be your, you can have this entrepreneurial spirit and say, okay, um, I've seen how this works, for example, in uh, provisioning. And I think this is not working properly. And I, I want to, you know, create my own provisioning company in, in the business of yachting. So I think you have to be very curious when you are in the yachting because there are so many opportunities to be land-based afterwards if you open your eyes and analyze what's not working and what you could make the difference where. I love it. Stay curious. See how you can improve yourself yeah. and the industry as a whole. And, and you can just go after it. If it doesn't exist, go and create it. 
Um, exactly. So amazing advice. Thank you so, so much. I cannot wait to share with the other people. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the first ever episode of Yacht Fum. If you like what you heard, please like, subscribe, and comment. Your comment will help us reach a broader audience. And don't miss the next episode.